The original idea behind creating this environment was to demonstrate some of the workflows I've talked about in this course. And hopefully you can see a lot of that stuff is represented here. But one thing led to another and I added a few elements that I've not discussed. These include water and procedural foliage, a couple Niagara systems, lighting, and a level sequencer to manage multiple elements of the shot. Unfortunately, I don't have the bandwidth to create tutorial content on these topics for this course, but I do want to include a high level overview. I'll also make this project available for purchase. If you want to take a deeper look, there'll be a link in the description. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the process for creating the sphere, halo, and pillar geometry using geometry scripting with an editor utility. Then I'll talk about the blueprint actors controlling the sphere, halo, and clouds. A lot of the blueprint events, Niagara systems, and material parameter animation happens in the sequencer, so I'll go over the basics of using a level sequence to manage dynamic elements in a shot, and I'll also talk a little bit about water and procedural foliage and the Niagara systems that I use to complete this scene. So these are the various stages of the sphere as it was developed. It started off as a soccer ball primitive in Maya. I subdivided it once and then did some basic poly modeling operations to do some insets and some extrudes to get it into this state. Once I had it set up, I did a simple fracture operation and I wanted to be able to separate the stone part from the gold part. So back at this stage, I assigned two different materials. So that's the reason why the uh, interior is white and the exterior is red, because that material assignment is preserved through the fracture operation and the final output mesh can be separated by materials. So I added uh, some functionality to the editor utility to, to do that. I didn't arrive at this immediately. It took a little bit of experimentation. You can see here where I was just playing with some different ideas of how to separate this thing and split it up and fracture it and run some simulations on it. I ultimately ended up just going with something simple that I was going to animate in the uh, blueprint. So once I had the pieces separated and the fracture assigned to both, then I wanted to distribute this little spiral form around the surface. I think I may have also created the spiral in Maya as well. But um, anyway, so once I did that, then I went through the process that I demonstrated where I calculated the normals, randomly distributed them on, on the surface here, did a subtract operation with the Booleans, and then I processed the whole thing. And you can see it's got this wrinkly stuff on it, but that's just from the material. So this is ultimately where I landed. To animate this thing, well, I'll talk about the blueprint for animating in a minute. Let's talk quickly about the pillars. So for the pillars, I just created a simple hex extrusion with basically just a low poly cylinder, did a little bevel on the top there, used a bend deformer in the modeling toolkit to create this configuration, a circular pattern. And then I just did a simple fracture on it. I dropped it down. I don't know if I have any uh, sitting out here that you can see easily, but this, this is actually a pretty good example. Let me just roll over here. So I dropped it and some of them fell over and it got a nice little bit of like a, a irregularity to it. And then I processed it in the exact same way that I processed this stuff over here to effectively smooth the edges and bake some ambient occlusion, which I used for the uh, dis distribution of this golden material layer here. Okay. Now for the, uh, for the halo, same idea. I just created some concentric rings, and then I dropped them and baked out the state of the geometry there as a static mesh. But one thing I wanted to do is I, I sort of liked, I wonder if I can open this up real quick and head over to the fracture menu. So there's this explode option, right? And I thought that was really kind of cool, but it's not something that you can export. Like if you, no matter what you have here, if you try to write it out to a mesh, it's just going to be the, if there's a chaos cache, it'll ha have that bone position or it'll just be this. So I added a feature to the, uh, to the processing here to explode it. So there's like a, a little bit of extra functionality in there that, that sets this up. Okay, cool. I think that's pretty much everything in terms of how the geometry was created. So once this geometry was finished, I wanted to be able to animate each piece individually in order to make that happen. I needed to split it into its various pieces, which is easy to do here uh, in modeling mode in the transform menu, there's a split button and we'll go ahead and uh, break your geometry up into its various pieces. You can see there are lots and lots here. And then I needed a way to get all of these loaded into a blueprint as static mesh components. So there is a very handy process for that. You use a get assets by path node. You feed it the path. It's going to need this get asset registry piped into the target. And what it's going to return is an array of asset data. 
The cool thing about asset data is you can get all kinds of useful information about the asset. It can be a little bit opaque here in Blueprint land, but if you look at the Python API, which is very, very handy. So I'm in the 5.3 Python API documentation. Here's our asset data object. What you can see is it has the ability to get a class, you can get the asset class, you can get the path, you can get the name, and you can also get the asset itself. This will return the object. So that's what we're looking for here. So out of my asset data array, we're gonna do a, a for each loop to iterate over each one. And then we can just use this get asset function on the asset data object to get the object itself, cast it to a static mesh, just to make sure it's actually a static mesh in case there's something else in there that I don't want. And then I'm going to add a static mesh component. And at this point, it should start to look a little bit familiar, doing some stuff with the materials here. And then, yeah, just adding it as a static mesh component. Set the cast shadow. I didn't want it casting shadows because it looked a little bit strange on the sphere underneath it. And also they were casting shadows on each other, which is kind of a, an odd effect. So I just disabled that. Once I had all my static mesh components added to the blueprint, I stored them in an array. And then I wanted the movement of each piece to be a little bit randomized. So I created a random value here between negative 30 and 30 that I was going to use to offset the movement, which I'll talk about here in the next step. We're going to use a sine wave to control the movement of each piece. And I thought it might be useful to do a quick review on how sine waves work. Basically what you do is you feed it degrees around a circle and you will generate values that if graphed will produce a sine wave. And the range of numbers is gonna be between one and negative one. So if you do zero to 360, you're gonna get this. If you do 360 to 720, you're gonna get the same wave. 720 to 1080, the same wave over and over for infinity, right? So this is a really nice way to get a consistent repeating wave. You just feed it an ever increasing stream of numbers. And once we've got our sine wave, we're gonna to wanna to modify the frequency or wavelength as well as the amplitude to get the behavior that we're looking for. All right, back in the blueprint, we have this open sphere event. And the first thing we're gonna hit is a timeline. So the timeline is gonna give us float values determined by curves. So what we have is, if we go back to the event timeline, we have a fade in value, and that's gonna be modifying the amplitude. We have a scale value, which we are getting our, our sine value from. And then there's going to be a scale pulse for when we have our little explosion. And then there's some emissive controls and then a couple of events. So let's look at the curves themselves. We have the scale curve, which goes from one to 10 over 30 seconds. And then we have our, let me zoom in on this a little bit so it's a bit easier to see. This is going to be our fade in, right? So we're going to start off at zero and then we have a nice ramp up to probably one at 14 seconds and then that lasts for a little while and then we fade it back out. So what we're doing here is we are multiplying this curve into the values that we're getting from this curve. So it is effectively, this is going to give us a very consistent sine wave, right? And then this is going to start that sine wave off very, very small. So our, our amplitude is initially very, very small, and then it gets a little bit bigger, and then it gets smaller again. So that gives us our, our fade in and fade out. Let's take a quick look at the logic here in the event graph. So what I'm doing is I am modifying the value from our scale by multiplying it by 190. Now 190 is basically changing the wavelength or the frequency. So if you, if you change this value, the timing of the of the pulse is modified. So 190 is just kind of like where it made sense for the, the overall timing that I was looking for. It's a, a little bit arbitrary just based on the scenario. And then I've got my random values. Remember we created those over here. So I'm taking whatever the output is of the current scale times 190, and then I'm going and grabbing the random value generated for each piece, and I'm adding that in. So every piece is just offset just a little tiny bit. So then I take the sine of that and I multiply it here by our fade in. So this is going to basically squash it at the beginning and make it normal in the middle and then squash it again uh, towards the end. And I have this uh, whole thing being multiplied by scale pulse. So in the scale pulse, it is actually going to start off at a very low number and stay there for almost the entire time. That low number is going to be 0.1. So we're multiplying all of the scale variation initially by 0.1, let's zoom in on that a little bit, and, think, and then I think it goes up to something like oh, 0.35, right? So like all of these values are, are being clamped between a pretty small range, and then it, it goes back down to 
So the reason that I'm keeping these values small is because what I'm doing is a scale operation. I don't want it to like, as soon as this kicks in to jump to some random scale point, I want to be starting from a scale value of one. So let's go back over here. So everything gets subtracted from one. So we're basically just going a little bit above one and a little bit below one. And that's going to give us our relatively controlled scaling, pulsing, breathing movement in and out. So when I take those values and I pipe them into the relative scale for each piece, right? We're, we're iterating over those pieces here with a for loop. And that is how I create that movement. So there's also some other events here that we will talk about in a moment. Uh, and this is just kicked off by event tracks here in the timeline, which is a, a wonderful feature. So it, it becomes very easy to have a thing happen exactly when you want, like spawning the stars, and let's see what else. The next one down, it's in here somewhere. Heat moons, right? So uh, turning on the heat emissive glow for the moons. And speaking of emissive, we can take a look at that. That's gonna be the same thing. And you can see there's a correlation here in terms of the spike in the scale, the scale pulse. And when that emissive kicks up, and I think the emissive value gets up pretty high, goes to about 11. So we start off at zero, there's a little bit of warming, and then there's a big pulse when it does its explosion thing, and then it tapers back out. So the next thing we take a look at is our rotate planet custom event, which is just going to take the entire actor blueprint and rotate it. You can see we've got a set actor rotation node, and it is uh, set to use self as its target, which is this thing itself. And then I have a timeline. Timeline has a length of 60 seconds, just to make sure I give myself plenty of runway. And we go from zero to oh, 1.247, blah, blah, blah. And I think this number being kind of random was just dialing in the rotation speed itself. We take that float stream, multiply it by 300, and then pipe that into the rotation Z. So if I wanted this to be faster, I could increase this value, or I could multiply it by some larger number, or slower. You know, you could you do the opposite, decrease uh, either one of these. So that is a simple way to control the rotation. Uh, the next thing we'll talk about here is our add moons function, which is a little bit more complicated. So worth mentioning that rotate planet is a custom event and add moons is a function. There's no reason for it to be a function. It probably should have been an event, but I, I just decided to make it a function at some point and now it is a function. So, all right, we'll hop in there. I wanted to make 20 moons. So I use a for loop to repeat the following steps. We're gonna add a child actor component, which is basically kind of like a group node in Maya. It's just an empty thing. It doesn't have anything in it, but it lives at the origin. And we're gonna be doing a uh, like a parent operation thing here. So this will look a little bit familiar if you watch the, the stuff on the, the rainbow helix thing. So once I've got my component, I'm gonna store it in an array called moons. And then I'm gonna add a static mesh component. I'm going to set that static mesh component to be my moon mesh. And then we'll set the material on it. So it's got this kind of gold stone thing, I think. Or actually, it's just straight up gold. Uh, and then I'm going to set the relative location. So now I'm moving all of the moons as I create them to some random spot at between 1200 and 1800 in X and Y. So they're all kind of clustered outside of the sphere in some random range. Once I have them sitting someplace random, I go ahead and... Uh, randomize the scale a little bit. So some of them are bigger and some of them are smaller. Turn off cast shadow because I didn't want to casting shadows on the surface of the rocks. And then I attach each sphere static mesh component to the regular child actor component. And then once I've got that set up, I'm going to throw a random rotation on there for the child actor component. So now the spheres are just distributed randomly around the planet or the sun or whatever body we want to we want to assign there. And then I'm going to create another randomized value to change the moon speed. And we'll use this a little bit uh, later on in, in the next event, which is going to be animate moons. Let's head back over to the event graph. So the animate moons event has a peculiarity, which is that there is a timeline, but I'm not actually using any data from it. If I open it up, I think I did throw a curve in there, but I ended up not needing it. But what it does do is it loops, and this is very important. Uh, so it will continue firing the update pin over and over again. So and the reason that I need to do this is originally this event was on tick. So all of this stuff was happening you know, on tick, which is, which is a, su a subset of each frame. But what I discovered is when I rendered it in the level sequence, the animation was much, much faster. So tick is different 
when you're just doing a regular play and editor versus when you are rendering. So that wasn't going to work. So I created this workaround here, which is just a, a simple timeline. So I'm going to iterate over the moon's array, which is the child actor components that are at the origin of the blueprint, as opposed to the actual moons themselves, which are parented and randomly positioned to the moons components here. So what I can do is I can rotate the moons and the actual moons themselves will, will follow that rotation. Hopefully that makes sense. I have this for loop, which is going to generate a unique array index value for each moon as I iterate over the loop. And I can use that index to get the moon speed that I created for each moon back at the beginning. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. What I'm doing is I'm saying, first of all, is the, the random moon speed uh, above or below zero? Feed that into a branch. If it's above zero, I'm gonna rotate on the Z axis. And if it's below zero, I think that's how that works. Uh, let's see, that's greater than whatever. You can figure it out. Basically, it's just a simple way to have the rotation be a little bit different randomly on all the moons. And then I take the moon speed, which I can't remember exactly what that was. Let's see, it's between negative five and five and multiplying it by 0.75. And then I'm just adding it to the world rotation. So what that means is it has some rotation. And I'm just taking a small value and then adding it to the current value. So each frame, we're gonna go ahead and update that uh, to the next value. And that's how we get our nice rotation that repeats forever. Again, courtesy of our looping timeline. All right, so we've got our heat moons event, which is triggered about 14 seconds in uh, with this event track in our open sphere timeline. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna generate a float stream from this curve. And that is going to be piped into a node downstream of it. But before we get there, we're gonna iterate over all of the moons, which again are those empty groups. And then we need to, uh, for each one of those, we're going to get all of the children components. In this case, there's only gonna be one for each moon, which would be the actual geometry floating around the outside of the sphere itself. That's going to, by default, return an array. So we've gotta pipe that into another for loop. And then I want to set the scalar parameter value on the material for whatever the geometry is. I have to cast it to a set mesh component in order to have access to this functionality, right? So like out of here, the only thing that this knows is that it's a child component and it could be a million different kinds of things. So if I want to modify a scalar parameter, it has to be a static mesh component. So like if I were to pull off of here and type in set scalar, you can see this doesn't exist because this object doesn't have this functionality. This is a subclass, a static mesh component is a subclass of a regular component, right? You can see there, it's gonna be a scene component object reference. So this is very generic. So if you wanna access functionality that uh, you know is on your object, you have to cast it so that you can, you can get access to all the things that a static mesh component owns, such as set scalar parameter value on materials. So what we wanna do is we wanna set a parameter name called fire emissive. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna look at the geometry that's being piped in here, find the material, actually find all the materials, and then it's gonna look for a parameter on any of the materials that are assigned called fire emissive. So how do we set that up? Let's hop over to wherever we're adding our moons in. So we're going to set the static mesh to this SM moon sphere. Take a look at that. That will be this guy right here. And this piece of geometry, I can open it up, is assigned to M hot rock by default. But the next node over here in our moon setup is going to be set the material. So we're actually going to set it to this MI gold. Let me take a look at that. So it is a material instance and we can hop over to M gold. And if you look at M gold, we're going to have some controls here to set up that emissive behavior. So here's our fire emissive parameter. It's going to be talking to the ambient occlusion. It's going to take that into account. So I think I just went through in the modeling menu and painted uh, white into the green channel. So that is how that is set up. And I use that trick for uh, pillar stuff down here. If you go to the sequencer, and we kind of scrub over here, you'll see that the emissive there in the crevices uh, lights up. And that's just basically the ambient occlusion baked into the geometry uh, that is being multiplied against that emissive color. All right, so that's probably a good place to stop for this video. We've covered the process of creating the geometry and the, the nuts and bolts of how this blueprint actor is set up to generate that animation. So, um, and we've touched a little bit on the sequencer. So I think that's probably the thing that we'll pick up in the next video because it's a significant topic in and of itself. So I'll see you there.